Greg is doing uh, yeah. 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 Ye
Honor Student by Michael Erickson. Scene. In the dark, the sound of rain. Naomi Orozco Wallace appears in a cool, bright light. She is a brisk, confident, if somewhat guarded teacher of creative writing at a small college. She's a petite woman who dresses with a hip downtown sensibility that gives her an aura of talent and rebelliousness. To most people, she seems much taller than she is. Her collection of short stories led the New Yorker to dub her one of the 20 most promising writers under 40 in the US, but that was years ago. Her next book, a novel, has stalled in rewrites. It's rained for days, a cold, relentless rain that creeps into everything. Our classroom is damp, warm, too warm for the sleep deprived. Condensation fogs the windows, there's a none too pleasant smell in the room. It's the post midterm funk that settles over a small college in late October. I'm leading a creative writing workshop. <coughs> a student, Ginger Kanabi, is reading a very heartfelt story in a weak, trembling voice. Her adolescent character, a thinly veiled version of herself, is confronting some life changing event in the passive voice. <laughs> I'm straining to listen, but my mind is not in attendance today. It's briefly in bed with my lover, then tumbling over some sticky phrase in my novel, or saying the goodbye I never said to my father. If I'd been there at the end, what would I have said? I play the scene over and over. The room has grown deathly quiet an uncertain moment. Is the story over? Was that it? Ginger stares at me expectantly. She blinks several times and bites her lower lip. A few students shake themselves from their narcotic stupors. <laughs> a dark-haired girl yawns and stretches luxuriantly. Two weedy-looking boys watch her with mild interest. Well, I say, who'd like to comment on Ginger's story? Anybody? Anybody? Silence. Blank expressions. <coughs> I prod a few students into speaking. I get a few okays and I liked it fine. <coughs> Nothing specific. Vague generalities. The condemnation of polite indifference. Ginger snuffles, fighting back tears. There is no escape from the humiliation of a failed story. I know. My heart aches for her. I want to protect her to put my arm around her, tell her to go back to her dorm room, have a good cry, then sit down and start writing again. Nice effort, I say. Some really nice moments here, I, I add, by way of a pat on the back. Nice work. Ginger bows over her neatly typed story and smiles. I'll read the story again, I promise myself. Write her some helpful comments. Invite her over for tea. <laughs> the rain stops. Then the quiet boy with the intense blue eyes begins to read his story. And suddenly, I'm wide awake. Jason appears in a warm light on the darkened stage. He is a good looking young man, clean shaven and well dressed. It's raining and I'm late. They've already begun when I slip into class. They are reading, their heads bent over as if in a last prayer. I gently close the door and stand still. A very serious, very thin girl with frizzy red hair is reading aloud. It's a coming of age story. It's about the death of a pet turtle. It's a very important story and she reads it as if it was a very important story. <laughs> she, she's pressed over her pages, gulping air at the end of each sentence. I can see her ribs pressing against her thin cotton sweater. She reads with a slight lisp. I'd like to kiss that lisp feel its caterpillar tickle on my lips. I remain immobile, invisible to them like I've always been. I shift my weight. My socks are wet from my run from the bus stop. I slip my heavy black backpack off my shoulder and ease it to the floor. I wait, still nothing. No one notices as I lift the Glock to the head of the nearest boy. Do I like him or not? I can't remember, can't remember. His head explodes and his body drops instantly. The shot momentarily paralyzes everyone in the small room. I can feel my heartbeat in my ears. Time stands still. There's a smell of urine and burnt leaves. 
Then I can hear screaming, chairs falling, but it's all far away. A frat boy starts for the door and I fire. He swats wildly at the air as if shooing away wasps. Two shots miss, but a third lifts and briefly pins him to the dry erase board. Here is your lesson for today. I step over the professor. She's in a fetal crouch, hands splayed over the back of her head. I turn to the ginger girl with the cute lisp. There is a flicker of recognition. Scene, the college office of Professor Naomi Orozco Wallace. Two chairs, a desk. <coughs> Naomi and Jason sit across from each other. Jason, can you tell me why you wrote this? Uh, you said we were to write a story for the class. I mean, this particular story. <laughs> the subject matter. Oh, I don't know. You don't know? I mean, where do your ideas come from? Who knows? Uh-huh. <laughs> and do you think this is an appropriate topic for a creative writing class? I can't say what's appropriate or not. Really? I'm just a student. You don't think this is inappropriate? I write. I write whatever comes to me. But you can see why some people might find this upsetting. I could tell there were some people in the class who didn't like my story. Didn't like? Yeah, I could tell right away. They never like anything I write for the class. I don't think that's the case. They just don't like me. I, no, Jason. My work. <laughs> I really don't see that at all. Oh, my bad. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Did you write this to get back at some class members? Why would I do that? It's not personal, what we do in the writing workshop. Uh-huh. It's about the work. Got it. I don't think anyone has a personal motive for their comments in class. Duly noted. It's not personal. So you're saying I'm not a good writer? No, not at all. It's, it's OK. I don't expect everyone to like my work. It's not a matter of liking or not liking <laughs> your work. This is beyond that. The story you wrote, it's disturbing, shocking. Oh, then that's good? Uh, yes. I, I mean, no. You I, said it was good to get the reader's attention right away. Uh, yes. <laughs> to control the narrative. Look, Jason, you can't yell fire in a theater. I didn't do that. You might as well have. Your characters, your descriptions of your characters are remarkably similar to students in our class. They are? Weren't you aware of that? The girl with red hair sounds like... I don't think about my process too much. I feel it diminishes the spontaneity of the work. <laughs> <laughs> she picks up the manuscript. A white male student who sounds very much like you, angry at criticism he's gotten in a writing class, comes to class with a gun and kills the female teacher who sounds very much like me. He then <coughs> proceeds to humiliate and torture his classmates one by one, reserving the most degrading humiliations for the female members of the class. There's way more to it than that. But you can see how this might upset some people. The story you wrote was very upsetting. But that's not what I wrote. I'm sorry? You're denying you wrote this? Yes. I, no, I, I did, but you're making it sound like I'm some sort of singer. But you did write this. You didn't even let me finish reading it in class. I suggested it would be best not to continue. You stopped me. You made me stop. I couldn't let you. You made it out to sound like I'm a. I uh, couldn't let you read something like this. It, there are reasons why the guy does what he does. What reason can there be for mass murder? It was supposed to be a joke, like a, a Tarantino movie. <laughs> a joke? Did you hear anyone laughing? That's because you didn't let me finish. It all gets explained in the end. I read the end. Everyone's dead. There's nothing funny about it. I guess we'll just disagree on that. <laughs> it's an aesthetic. <laughs> an aesthetic? No one was laughing. No one. Not after they see the teacher react so negatively, no. Look, I'm just trying to protect the students in the class. From what? Daring prose? Art? An authentic voice? No, from being terrified. Everybody else gets to read their stories, no matter how lousy they are. And we all have to sit there and listen. How, how about the girl who wrote the story about the turtle funeral? She could have bored us all to death. You didn't censor her. <laughs> no one else wrote about forcing a young woman to perform fellatio on a lunatic who's just committed mass murder. Are you saying stuff like that doesn't happen? You ever see The Sopranos? The usual suspects? I think you're confusing fiction with life. I thought we were creating fiction from life. 
I'm not going to play this game with you. What game? Oh, please. I'm sorry? Right. Play the innocent. You knew exactly what you were doing when you brought that story into class. What? You wanted to provoke. You wanted to scare. You wanted to get a reaction. How do you know what I wanted? You wanted us sitting there terrified of you, wondering what kind of person would do this, wondering if you could do this to us. That's a big assumption, Miss Orozco Wallace. I saw your face as you were reading this. You enjoyed it. It made you feel powerful. You wanted us to be afraid. You got off on it, didn't you? No, I swear I didn't. And you knew very well what was going through our minds. I'm not a mind reader. Similar attacks, campus shootings like at Virginia Tech. What? No, I'm going for a certain stylistic, aesthetic impact. I, I consider myself a kind of performance artist, a fiction provocateur. Okay, what? I'm exploring boundary situations. Oh, what nonsense. You can't say that. You don't know. I, I think about stories all the time. It's like I'm constantly writing stories in my head. I'm sure you do too. Daydreaming, the, the what if, that's what we do, isn't it? We? Jason, you had to have known what you were doing. I know what I was doing. You read a story about killing and raping students in a class very similar to the class you're reading it to. I think I know what was in your mind. It's fiction. Fiction, I thought we were supposed to be writing fiction. This isn't fiction. It's just a story. It's made up fiction. A death threat isn't a work of fiction. Whoa! A death threat? You're reading way too much into this. This is a threat. I know it, you know it. It's bullying, terrorizing for whatever sick, twisted thing you have going on. Sick? <laughs> twisted? You've just totally judged me. You see one different piece of work, fiction, art, and you totally labeled me. Art? Please. I wasn't completely sure before, but now I am. You read this to intimidate us. How many times do I have to tell you no? It's just a story. I'm sorry if you didn't like it. I'll write something else next time. Next time? <laughs> there is no next time. You can't kick me out of class. I'll lose my financial aid. That's not my problem. I need these credits. Why are you punishing me like this? You know, as you were reading this in class, I must admit I was scared. Really scared like everybody else, terrified. My first impulse was to say nothing, to just let you do this thing, to just get past it, deal with it later. But then I saw you smile. Smile? You gave it away. You knew very well what you were doing. You got a chill, lady. You were smirking. You gave it away, and I thought, if I don't stop this now, you'll get away with it. You'll have the power. I'm not gonna sit here and pretend this isn't happening just because I'm scared of you. Scared you'll come back and kill us. This stops now. Hey, 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 I can't be responsible, held responsible for your imagined threats. Imagined? Okay, you know what? We're done. This is totally wrong. Fine. Totally unjust. Okay, goodbye. I paid for that class. I worked hard to make the money to pay for it. You can't just throw me out. Oh, you're out all right. But before you go, you're going to apologize to the class. Apologize? Yep. You can't make me do that. Watch me. You'll be sorry you did. Scene, the dean's office. Naomi paces while Davis Marion sits on the couch looking from Jason's story to Naomi. Davis is an academic dean at the college. He's a handsome, trim man a couple years older than Naomi. He looks like the kind of guy who played lacrosse at an Ivy League college, which he did. His suit jacket is off, <laughs> draped over the back of the couch. Try to calm down. Does this mean he's actually going to, to, to do something? Wait, wait, Naomi, wait a minute. Then I'll just get a gun myself. A gun? You are not getting a gun. Why not? He's got one. You don't know that. I don't know that? I don't know that? No, you don't. Oh, he'd like us to think he has. Maybe, maybe not. What do you mean? You don't know. I don't? No. Where's your proof? It's implied. Where? It, in this, in the way he talked to me. It's frightening. Did he say, I have a gun? Not directly. Did he say, I am going to hurt well, you? Of course not. He's too smart. Christ, Naomi. But it's understood. It's there. It's understood. It's in the subtext. The subtext? The subtext. It's insinuated in the subtext. So, I'm telling the provost I'm expelling a student because of his bad subtext. You don't believe me. 
Of course I do. You know I but do. You're the dean. Think of something. I said I believe you, but I need something more. Isn't this enough? Maybe. Don't know. Davis. Let me read it first. Well, I'm getting a gun. I'll sleep better. You are not getting a gun. You can't even work a toaster. They say, <laughs> they say you sleep better knowing you have a gun. Oh, that's a great idea. Giving guns to the sleep deprived. I can't sleep on a good day. And now this Jason Kemp thing, I can't sleep at all. I'm standing here, falling apart, and you... Could you just hold me a minute? No, it's not. Naomi. This kid is seriously creepy. It'll be okay. Huh? I'll deal with this guy. He scares me. <laughs> no kidding. Don't worry. I'll handle it. This is not funny. Did I say that it was? You're the dean. Help me. I am. But not this. Not now. I'm sorry. I, I think I've seen him around my neighborhood. What? Seriously? I don't know. I'm not sure. I, Maybe he lives near. I know. Yeah. Naomi, you need to relax. <laughs> Tell me about it. Now, I find sex very relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> How about it? Not a good time, huh? Davis opens a cabinet. Right. Well, then, how about a drink? Fine. Scotch? Mm, sure, okay, but why not? <laughs> Good. And on a different subject? He pours a couple of drinks. I know I'm not supposed to ask, but how's the book coming along? No, you're not supposed to ask. You know, maybe some of your tension is from... I don't want to talk about it. It can't hurt. Yes, it can. The book. You know you need a book for tenure. She takes the offered drink. Ready. Alcohol. <laughs> that always makes everything better. Cheers. Okay, uh, I'll talk about the book. It's a mess. No, it's a hot mess. My editor was fired. They're reconsidering the project. Five rewrites, six years of work down the drain. You don't know that. Oh, I know that. You could send it elsewhere. Oh, who publish it? Three editors and my own spinelessness. I've rewritten it into pulp. Even I don't know what it's about anymore. I've done what I tell my students not to do, work something to death. Oh. And I don't have anything else. Nothing. They drink in silence for a moment. Since we're on awkward subjects, uh, she who must not be named, gets back from D.C. this weekend. And? I'll tell her. Tell her what? That it's over. Hmm. She knows it's over. Been over. Does she? I know she knows. How could she not? You know she knows. <laughs> yes. Are you saying it's understood? It's there? It's understood? It's in the subtext? <laughs> yes. Okay, it's in the subject. Goes without saying. Oh, you don't need a medical examiner to call this marriage dead. Dead have been known to come back to life. What's that supposed to mean? You do trust me, <clears throat> don't you? I don't trust me. Thanks for the drink, Dean Herring. Hey, Professor, where are you going? To my writer's cave, where I will spin my pain and misery into fictional gold. Stay. Have dinner with me. An affair, a failed book, and a potential student mass murderer. What can I make of all that? <coughs> Something good, I bet. A bestseller. Naomi, it's going to be okay. Trust me. By next week, this will all be over. Will it? Well, I'll start with this kid, this Jason Kemp, tomorrow. <coughs> Just tell me I'm not crazy. You're not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and you're still going to the Provost's Halloween party? Maybe. It'll be fun. I like the idea of being with you in public and no one knows we're together. It's exciting. 
My problem is people see right through me. I hope not. Become as some great literary figure. I was thinking of Jane Austen, but maybe Virginia Woolf would be more appropriate. <laughs> Look for the lady with the rocks in her pockets. Be careful, Davis. There's something about the student. Forget about him. He'll be gone in no time. I don't know. He creeps me out. Don't worry. I'll put the fear of God on him. Now, go home. Get some sleep. You need it. I've got a bad feeling about this. I can be very persuasive, as you know. I wonder. I wonder where we'll be when this is all over. Davis looks at the manuscript in his hands. Scene, the dean's office. Davis and Jason sit opposite each other in comfortable chairs. There is a coffee table between them. <clears throat> Good to meet you, Jason. Would you like some coffee? No, thanks. Water? No, thank you. OK. Well, thanks for coming in on such short notice. Not a problem, sir. But I'd like to hear your side of the story. Uh-huh, sure. Um, I was wondering if you could tell me a little about yourself first. What, about me? Yes. like. Where are you from? What are your interests? I'm from Mexico, my uh, Mexico? Missouri, small town. <laughs> <laughs> and your family? Uh, Dad was a machinist. He died. Uh, my mom works in a bakery. I see. And you transferred from a state university? I started there, then had to, well, took some time off. My mom thought I'd get a better education at a private school, smaller classes. It costs more, but she thinks it's worth it. And what do you think? I don't know. It's better, I guess. Do you have friends here? I'm getting to know people. <clears throat> now, Jason, these are serious allegations. Yes, sir. But Dean Davis, I could say some things, too. Things about what Professor Roscoe Wallace has said in class. What sort of things has she said? Things about... Yes? Things that made some of us feel uncomfortable in the class. Like? <coughs> Could you give me an example? Things like, uh, no, I, I don't want to start. This is so janky. Well, OK. Then could we talk about the story that you wrote for class? Sure. Professor Orozco Wallace says you wrote this story to provoke and humiliate members of your class. It was meant as a sort of a, a performance. A performance? A performance or not? This is a serious charge, Jason. I know. Regardless of your intent, this is serious. Very serious. I'm sorry she interpreted it that way. She claims several of your classmates were also frightened by the story. Really? Who? No one said anything to me. Well, maybe they were too afraid to say something. Have you talked to anyone in the class? Well, no. I'm guessing. You're guessing? You're guessing? Well, like I said. You weren't there. No, I wasn't there, but Professor Orozco Wallace was. And now she started this, I suppose they'll all hate me. Jason, I don't think anyone hates you. I'm sorry, this has completely blindsided me. Is this revenge for some perceived injury or slight? What? No, how can you say that? I, I thought I wrote a strong story. But you can see how a story like this might upset people. I didn't use anybody's names in it, and the descriptions could be anybody. Your teacher says the descriptions are close to students in the class. You've never been in the class. Did you base your characters on some of your classmates? It's fiction. A story. Some, sometimes people read too much into a story. Jason. Not everything has to mean something. True, but... She doesn't know what was in my mind when I wrote that story. She's just making stuff up herself. I'm sorry, I, I interrupted you. Professor Roscoe Wallace says the story is about a young man who walks into a college creative writing class, shoots the teacher, then systematically tortures several of his classmates. She says the victims and the shooter are based on students in the real class you are in. You haven't read it? I have, yes. I guess I'm still trying to form an opinion of it. What did you think? Very powerful, vivid, and, well, disturbing. 
If it was badly written, would it have that impact? If it was boring, would I be sitting here? I'm a philosopher, not an English professor, and I'm not the best judge of what constitutes good creative writing. If it was badly written, you could say, well, this guy's a lunatic, mentally unbalanced, lock him up, but it's not. Professor Orozco Wallace said she wanted vivid, active, arresting prose from us. She, she wanted us to take chances in our writing. I thought I was doing what she wanted. Well, I can't debate the technical or the literary merit of the work. It, is this the raving of a homicidal maniac, or, or is it a story that tries to get into the mind of a homicidal maniac as he is doing something unspeakable? It's hard to be objective about something like this. Ah, it's a subjective thing. As Hegel says. Maybe there's something else going on here. Maybe it's not about me. Maybe it's about some issue Professor Roscoe Wallace has. Why do I have to explain myself? Because no one else wrote a story about killing members of a creative writing class for a creative writing class. <laughs> That's why. And you really don't seem to understand why some people just might be concerned about that. She didn't say not to write about that particular subject. Jason, please. <laughs> well, she didn't. It's not on the syllabus, not in the student handbook. Why not give us a list of approved story topics ahead of time? I don't know what subjects you consider taboo. Why not just be upfront about it? This is supposed to be an educational institution. Tell me what you think I should know. It's not about censorship. We would never censor any student's work. Right. It's about the content. I mean the context. <laughs> I think Professor Orozco Wallace feels the context of your story was inappropriate. Oh, the context? So if the story was about a postal worker snapping and going on a killing spree, that would be okay? Possibly. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> now look, Jason. Can you look at a person's writing and predict their future behavior? I mean, that's what she's really saying here. You think I could do what I wrote? Do you really think I could kill people? We have a responsibility to the larger community. How about Cormac McCarthy? He wrote The Road and No Country for Old Men, pretty brutal, violent work. Is he going to start killing people? How about Anne Rice? Isn't Professor Roscoe Wallace afraid Rice will start sucking people's blood? I'm sure she would never think that. How well do you know her? <laughs> what do you mean? Nothing. Anyway, <laughs> Professor Roscoe Wallace doesn't seem to think much of white male authors. She pretty much dismissed them all as a pack of sexist, racist homophobes. I find that hard to believe. I think you could be right. I think Cormac McCarthy would be a danger to society if he couldn't write. I think it's his writing that keeps him from going postal, being able to express himself, writing. It's how some of us make sense of the world. But why write about killing anybody? Don't we have enough of that? Because it happens. Because we live in a stupid, irrational world because we live in a world where your dad can go to work one morning and be dead by lunchtime, shot to death by a disgruntled former employee who came back to the tool and die plant with a duffel bag full of guns, shot down with seven others, even though they had nothing to do with the man's firing. I'm sorry. He'd actually made it out of the plant, but he went back in to try and warn others. That's when he was shot. Ironic, isn't it? So, Dean Herring, are you going to expel me? Oh, Jason, I don't think it needs to come to that. I'm glad we have this talk. So am I. Jason to the door. And I can stay in the creative writing class? Do you want to? This is why I'm here, to write, to make sense of the world. I'll talk to Professor Orozco Wallace when we get back. Sir, I apologize for, for any misunderstanding I may have caused. Thank you for listening to me. I appreciate that. Thank you. Scene, Naomi and Davis in his office. Naomi wears a long winter coat, pockets bulging with rocks. She also wears an odd prosthetic nose. Davis wears an Einstein costume, black coat, bright wig, and glasses. Trick or treat? I wanted Jane Austen, but I think Virginia Woolf is more mood this year. <laughs> Watch out for my rocks. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you look, uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Real rocks. And 
What's going on with the nose? Hmm. You know Nicole Kidman in the hours. Get it? <laughs> See? Oh. Ah. Did you get some sleep? <laughs> sort of. Counting sheep doesn't help. Drugs, however, do. <laughs> hey, did you talk to that guy? I have a sure cure for insomnia. Take one Davis in the evening. You'll sleep like a baby. I would if the drug were more widely available. Davis. Guess what? We can go to the provost party together. I mean, together, together. Isn't she? She went back to DC. Her court date was moved up. Did you talk to her? Tell her about us? Well, actually, no. Why not? I didn't get a chance. She was on the phone, constantly. Don't you think you should tell her before she finds out from someone else, like me? What do you want me to do? <laughs> Text her? Yes. Be sure to include a frowny face emoticon. <laughs> you know I have to do this face to face. Well, I'm tired of being the other woman. You are not the other woman. She is, if anyone is. How can she be the other woman if she's the one married to you? Because you are my soulmate. If you don't tell her, I'm going to start pitching these rocks at you. Not to worry. Let's go. I want to get there while people are reasonably sober. Yes. Why aren't faculty parties listed as a blood sport? <laughs> <laughs> because all the bleeding's internal. <laughs> Should be especially bloody this year with the provost retiring. Mm. Who will succeed him? How many hats will be thrown into that ring? Mine, for one. Oh. A man with ambition. I don't know how I feel about that. I happen to think I'd be a good fit, Miss Wolf. Uh, that's Ms. Wolf to you. <laughs> You've got my vote for getting rid of that student. Student? Jason. Oh, Kemp. Right. Yeah, he didn't show up for class today. I assume you threw the book at him, scared him off. I tell you, I was absolutely dreading class today. Even thought about calling in sick. You did expel me, Davis, didn't you? Davis, tell me you expelled him. I couldn't just summarily expel him. There's a whole process, a hearing, deliberations. Uh, okay, but you got him out of my class. Tell me that at least. You got him out of my class, didn't you? Oh, Davis! Naomi, it's complicated. Complicated? What's complicated about it? There's no clear policy. Isn't this covered in one of your how to be an administrator handbooks? <laughs> Look. Jason's being cooperative, polite even. His grades are outstanding, an honor student. There have been no other complaints about him. He denied that his story was meant to hurt anyone, and he apologized for the misunderstanding. Misunder... It wasn't a misunderstanding. He knew exactly what he was doing. Plus, I asked him to see the school psychologist, and he did. You sent him to Dr. Lerner? Lerner's a fossil, a senile misogynist. <laughs> he told three of my female students they should get married and have children. His advice for the stress of college. Naomi, calm down. <laughs> I had to get a psychiatric evaluation. Lerner's who we have. Oh, and I bet I know his diagnosis. Boys will be boys, am I right? His report is confidential. <laughs> but Lerner assures me Jason's not a danger to the community. Lerner says the odds that Jason will shoot anybody are infinitesimally small. <laughs> the odds that he might harm himself are much higher. Lerner says if we expel him, and it's not even certain that we can, we'd lose all control over him. And if we keep him here, we may be able to help him. Anyway, that's the current thinking in the field. The current thinking? <laughs> what about tomorrow? when that boy strolls into Pearson Hall with a backpack full of guns and ammo. What will be the thinking then, I wonder? I hope you're not talking like this in front of other people. Why? You can't say that. Oh, now I have to watch what I say? Yes! Talking about him as if he's a mass murderer isn't going to help. And if it gets back to him, this has the potential of getting out of control. What does that mean? Well, what if he files a grievance against you? Can you prove these allegations? Allegations? Listen, mister, I saw something in him. A cold, cruel something. He got off on reading that story in class, and when I talked to him about it, he smirked. He smirked. He smirked. That's your proof. 
But we thought it was funny. That's what's scary. You talked to him. What did you think? Okay, so he's an arsehole. I can't expel someone for just being an asshole. Half our students would be gone. Oh, he's not an asshole. He's a sociopath. Even Lerner should have seen that. I shouldn't tell you this, but he's had some family trauma in his past. His father was killed in a mass shooting at a machine shop. You're kidding. It happened a few years ago. Is it true? I think he's working out some personal issues with the story. Really? No, wait a minute. What? I don't believe it. Come on, Naomi. It can't be true. Nobody would lie about something like that. Nobody who'd lost a family member in a mass shooting could or would write something like that. Not like that. You can't make that assumption. But think about it, Einstein. Have you checked out his story? Well, not yet. He's bullshitting you and Lerner, and he's good at it because he's a, guess what, a sociopath. <sighs> Jesus, Naomi. Has anyone in the class said anything to you about what happened? Did anyone, during or after the class, tell you they felt threatened? <laughs> Did anyone come to you about it? Phone, email, anything? No, but that's probably because I stopped him. As soon as I realized what he was reading, I stopped him, dismissed the class, and hauled him into my office. The students most likely think I've dealt with him. Are they afraid of him? Who wouldn't be? Would some testify at a hearing that they felt threatened by him? Probably. Would they? But I guess. You know how students are. Wait, there's this one student, Ginger Kanabi. He seemed to take a sadistic pleasure in torturing her in his story. She's the one at the end who he... Oh, God. Right. Okay. Okay. Have you talked to her? Will she make a statement? She hasn't come back to class since his reading. I tried emailing her, but no response. I don't know where she is. I left a message with her advisor. Poor thing, she's probably traumatized. Find her. Make sure she's okay and see if she'll make a statement. I'm trying. She's a recent transfer. No one seems to know her. Keep trying. Is there anyone, anyone else who'll come forward? I'm sure if I talked to some of the other students, I could get them to realize how serious this is. I, I'm sure they'd come forward. And Jason, or his lawyer, would call that suborning witnesses. You're the teacher. They depend on you for their grades. Who would contradict your version of events? Oh, we're going to get all legal now, are we? He has rights, too. Oh, his rights. Yes, we mustn't trample on his rights. <clears throat> I'm just trying to show you how messy something like this can get, how out of control and dangerous. Don't you think I know? Women live with an awareness of violence and intimidation most men will never understand. Do you know how many women I know who've been assaulted? How many women carry pepper spray in okay. their purses? Okay. No, no, it's not okay. Girls are given a different narrative from the moment we're born. I'm sorry. All I meant was It'd be easier to expel him if he was openly violent and threatening. Oh, great. So we just wait for him to hurt somebody? If it was clear cut, I could do something about it. No question. Well, what about the story he wrote about a <coughs> mass killing on a college campus featuring his classmates? Isn't that enough? Yes. Well, maybe. I don't know. It's open to interpretation. Different people might read it differently. They may not see it the way you see it. Yes. Well, maybe. I don't know. It's perfectly clear to me. I know. I know. I know what he's up to. I know what he's capable of. Do you? What if you saw the story in a magazine or online? Didn't know the author? What would you think? Who published something like this? But it's possible. Someone might publish it. I suppose. All I'm saying is maybe we should stop and think. And do nothing? I am not going to do nothing. I didn't say he that! He might as well have. Listen, Naomi. Maybe this is exactly what he wants. What? To provoke us. Tie us in knots. Provoke us into overreacting. Doing something <coughs> rash. Make him the victim. Have you thought of that? No. But I have thought about the memorials and candlelight vigils they'll have after his killing spree. It'll probably be in April or May. That's when these guys seem to snap. The spring shooting season on college campuses. <laughs> Why the dramatics? Please, don't go there. And as Jason Kemp's story circulates among the press and grieving families, I've also
also thought of all the questions there will be. Here was a blueprint for a school shooting and nothing was done. Have you thought about that, Mr. Future Provost? My God, Naomi, would you just stop for a moment, please? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, something's wrong. I know it. I know it. I just don't know what to do. Okay, okay. You know I would never let anything bad happen to you or to anyone else. Never. Trust me, you have to. Yes. Ow, rocks. <laughs> <laughs> I can take care of this <laughs> quietly. Trust me. Okay, already. I said I trust you. Good. Good. Well, it's getting late. We should go <clears throat> to the party. You go. I, I don't think I'd be very good company. You sure? You're all right? I, I do have to put in an appearance. I know. Go. Appear. Get some sleep. Things will look better in the morning. Will they? Here. Have a rock. She gives him a rock. He disappears as the lights fade. A warm light on Naomi. When I finally struggle into sleep, this is what I dream. I'm seated at a table in an enormous bookstore, signing copies of my new novel, Border Destinations. It's a sprawling tale of several generations of family members on both sides of the US-Mexican border. The mestizo miracle of an Irish-Jewish Indian family. It's an unexpected bestseller. <laughs> the book signing line snakes through the bookstore and out the door. There's a festive, jovial mood in the store. As I sign each copy of my book, I engage the reader in a minute of banter. What's their name? Is the book a gift for someone? I thank them for coming out. I appreciate their support. And then I see him. Ten, twelve people back in line. Jason Kemp. With each book I sign, he gets one autograph closer to me. He's wearing an old overcoat with a black backpack slung over one shoulder. I slow down my signing. My focus begins to waver. Should I run? But I don't. Something keeps me rooted to my spot. Politeness. With each book I sign, he gets closer until He's right in front of me. Time stops. I feel my heartbeat in my ears. I see his hand reach inside the backpack. I see the gun as it emerges, a cold, lifeless thing. I see, I see. A blinding white flash of light, darkness. Scene, Jason's dorm room. Very Spartan, no decorations, a virtually empty space. Jason sits reading a document while Davis nervously stands. Conditions of continuance. I tried calling, emailing. Finally, I just decided to try your dorm room. The student agrees to Thought I'd try and catch cease you. and refrain from provocative behavior as specified. Interesting, very Spartan. Excuse me? Your room. You don't have much in the way of decorations. Almost none. Unusual. I like it that way. Davis sees a small framed photograph on Jason's desk. He picks it up. It's a photo of a red-haired girl. Jason takes it from Davis and lays it down. Sorry. Girlfriend? Mm. Yeah. What's her name? You don't know her. Oh. Sure. Um. Do you have a roommate? He left. No, it's not what you're thinking. <laughs> I wasn't thinking anything. He got mono. <laughs> you should see your face. <clears throat> but that's what you think of me, isn't it? Here's your confession back. I can't sign it. He hands back the paper to Davis. This is not an admission or confession. It's merely an agreement, an understanding between us. This sets a standard between both parties. It protects you. 
This makes it clear what the expectations are for you to continue in the writing class. Oh. This is a very standard agreement. If you don't sign it, I'm afraid you leave me no alternative but And I can stay in Professor Orozco Wallace's class if I sign it? I think so. Yes. I'll have to check with her, but yes, maybe. Davis gently presses the paper into Jason's hand. Um, Jason? I keep asking myself again and again, how did this happen? It's not the end of the world. You know, ever since I was little, all I ever wanted to do was write. I guess it was my way of trying to understand the world. I understand. You know, when I got into Professor Roscoe Wallace's class, I could hardly believe it. It's very hard to get in. I thought, finally, a mentor, someone I can talk to, and now I've ruined it. She hates me. No, no, she doesn't hate you. If I could explain. Sure. Just explain. You made a mistake, that's all. I made a mistake. That's right, you made a mistake. But we can fix that. I made a mistake. Sign here. Jason. Jason. Scene. Naomi sits at a table in a public space, a library. Jason stands before her, dressed as he was in her dream, overcoat and black backpack. He slips the backpack off of his shoulder and places it on the table between them. I shouldn't be doing this. Thank you. Thank you for letting me stay in the class. I, I know I'll never be able to redeem myself in your eyes. I know that. And I, I just wanted to apologize to you and the class. I never meant to. He reaches into his backpack. He fumbles in it for a second. Naomi, Naomi watches him with increasing alarm. As he pulls out something. <sighs> Professor? I was just wondering if you'd autograph your short story collection for me. He lays a book on the table. It's a rather worn paperback. He slides it toward her. Huh. Hello, stranger. He takes the book and examines it. I had a heck of a time finding it. I guess it's been out of print for a while. Wow. Looks like it's been read a few times, too. I like to see a well-used book. Three years to write, and now a sunken wreck. More like sunken treasure. The one story uh, set in Guadalajara, my, my grandmother's house, simply beautiful. It's inspiring. You've taken your life and turned it into art. Thank you. This is why I want to be a writer, to reach into myself, into my world, and find the truth. Naomi autographs the book. There was something you said in class one day that really stuck with me. What was that? It's about who controls the narrative in the end. That determines the outcome. And, and I thought, wow, that's true. Whether it's history, art, politics, or religion, the winner is the person who controls the narrative. Oh, well, I don't know if I meant it quite like that. But it's true. She hands him back the book. He puts it in his backpack. He takes out another manuscript. It's about who controls the narrative in the end. That determines the outcome. He gives her his new story. Oh, and uh, I was wondering if you could look at my new story. I, I know I have to get your permission to read it in class. I'd like to read it next week, if, if it's all right with you. Sure, I'll take a look at it. I know, I know. No promises, I'm on probation. Conditions of continuance and all that. Fair enough. Yeah, well, we'll see. I know you probably have classes to get to, so... I was sorry to hear about your novel. Excuse me? Border Destinations. Wasn't it just dropped by the publisher, Random House? How do you know that? I, I read about it in Publishers Weekly. You read Publishers Weekly? Well, I kind of deduced it, uh, since it's no longer on the Random House forthcoming list. And your editor's gone, too. I checked out of curiosity. What? You, you did? I think I heard some faculty in the department talking about it. People know? Are you saying people know? I feel know? that if one is serious about becoming a writer, one has to study and understand all facets of the business, from writing to publishing. I'm sorry for your setback. It must be hard, <laughs> like the death of a child. I, I suppose, look, I should... Or the death I of have a to father. Go. 
I know what it's like to lose a father. Do you think it was a subject matter? Wait. Wait, my father? What do you mean? My I father? I think it was a subject matter. I, I mean, it sounds like a rather provocative work about immigration and that sort of thing. Like maybe it's advocating for exceptional or special treatments, uh, treatment for Hispanics. People misunderstand. I know what it's like when people misunderstand your work. No, no. You can't compare yourself to me. It's a blow, isn't it? Granted, I mean, I haven't read the book. It just struck me that some people might be offended by the subject matter, that some people might object, that some people might think you were vilifying white people. Maybe that's really why the publisher dropped your book. No, 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 you have And you, you have gotta no wonder right to. if you're the right person to tell your story. Frankly, you don't look very Hispanic. I guess it helps your career to be a minority. Have you ever wondered about that? I hope this won't affect your getting tenure. My identity? Tenure? And what now, the hell? now you're in the position of teaching something you failed at. It's gotta hurt. Failed at? And you don't think I'm a very good writer? What gives you the right to talk to me like this? I can talk to you any way I want. This is so fucking over. You just can't take hearing the truth. Truth? Do you wanna know the truth? Smug little shit. My book? My father, my identity? Well, here's the truth. Fuck you. Fuck you and fuck Random House. I'm going to tell my story whether they want to hear it or not. And for that matter, fuck history. We were standing on the shore when you assholes arrived and fucked everything up with your greed, your murderous greed. And we're the aliens? I'll tell you who controls the narrative. You do, your people, all your great men, Washington, Jefferson, just a bunch of slave-owning aristocrats who didn't want to pay their taxes. Oh, and nothing's changed, nothing. And the handful of us who are allowed a voice, well, we can be shut up the minute we get out of line, muzzled, because you control everything. Media, publishing, everything. You don't like what we have to say, you revoke our privilege to say it. And I hate my part in all this, the token hire, the Latina voice. I don't look too ethnic, so I get to have a job. I can pass, and I play along with it. I'm a willing accomplice in the lie. I teach the lie. What are our classrooms? Hotel rooms for sleepwalkers. Go into any university library and you're walking into a mausoleum, a monument to dead white men, all built upon the oppression and exclusion of women and minor your so-called minorities. Do you know what it's like teaching your captor stories, teaching these dead white men's work to you smug, clueless little suburban idiots so you can live your lives of conformity, of privilege, oblivious? And once in a while, I get to throw in something from Toni Morrison or Sandra Cisneros, and we get to say, oh, isn't this an interesting perspective? Isn't this different? What do you think? And I try to push you fat Anglo slobs to think about someone other than yourselves for once, but we are still the strange other to you, weird, different, and and it never crosses your mind how much you are despised and hated. And it never crosses your mind how much I hate you. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I, I, why? Why are you doing this? Scene, Davis and Naomi. Another story. Don't tell me. Oh, it's not about torturing and killing his classmates. Oh, thank God. I thought you might like to read it. He throws the story on his desk. It's about you. Me? Well, it's actually about a Dean David Fisher, but the description is uncanny. It's got you down. Sport coat and turtleneck, right down to the part in your hair and the mole on your neck. What? Oh, it's well written. I'll give him that. Almost too well written. Oh, God. It's told from the point of view of a young college student, Jared, who is summoned to the dean's office. Jared, it seems, has written a story that the dean disapproves of. Sound familiar? Jason appears in a separate light. The dean sat on the edge of his desk. My story rolled up in his fist like a club. I nervously glanced around his office. 
There was a framed print of three bathing women, a Picasso, I think. A low bookshelf of philosophy books and ebony sculptures from Africa. Unbelievable. It gets better. After a scolding, the dean sends Jared away. Later, the dean appears in Jared's dorm room. What? You didn't go to his dorm room. I couldn't reach him, so oh, I... Davis! I thought I was helping him! Having ascertained that my roommate was away, the dean then began to tell me the terms of my conditional continuance at the college. My written work was to be strictly monitored for my own good. I was relieved, but then Dean Fisher asked me if I had ever seen the film Equus. <laughs> Equus! About how an older man helps a troubled boy come to understand his confused sexuality. What the? That never happened! It's vividly described. He then pressed himself to me. I could smell his cologne as he told me an older man could often help a younger man in trouble. That all I need do was place myself in his hands, sign his conditions of continuance. Oh my God. Somehow, he maneuvered me onto my bed. His hand undid my belt as he pushed me back. I felt powerless to resist. No, no, no! This is a lie! It's ridiculous! God damn him! What are you so upset about? It's only fiction, right? What the hell? Don't you want to read on? Our Dean Fisher goes on to sodomize young Jared several times in excruciating detail. The Marquis de Sade would blush. He's psychotic. Not according to our own Dr. Lerner. You gotta hand it to the boy. He's got talent. This is filth! Unbelievable! Oh, you'd be surprised what people can believe. Some people might think no one could have written this without having experienced it. What are you saying? Are you suggesting this really happened? No, but I can't say how other people might see it. I guess we'll find out on Thursday. What happens on Thursday? Jason will be reading it in class. You're not going to let him read this. If I stop him, what's my reason? The rapist sounds similar to an administrator here on campus? God, no! If I say no without an explanation, then I'm censoring him. <sighs> Let me think. Either way... Let me think! He's becoming a celebrity of a sort. What do you mean? Students are dropping the class. The female students, that is. What do they say? Nothing specific. No one will talk. Why won't they talk? And I just got a call from a reporter at the student paper. They'd like to interview me about censorship on campus. Oh my God. How did they... They stole them. Don't say anything. Now do you see why he frightens me? He's not going to stop. Okay, that's it. I've had enough. He's history. I'll start the paperwork immediately. Finally, Donna Hellinger enters without knocking. She is an imposing middle-aged woman with a wicked <laughs> sense of humor. She lugs a tote bag filled with papers. <sighs> well, here you are. Looks like I can kill two birds with one stone. Donna. What are you doing here? Unhappy business, Davis. Unhappy business. Mind if I sit? Donna Hellinger, Naomi... Yes, 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 we've also. met. Hello. Davis, I come as chair of the Campus Grievance Committee. Um, why? In short, you're being grieved. <laughs> the both of you, by a student by the name of Jason Kemp. I'm sure you know him. There you go. Kemp? He hands I'm... envelopes to Davis and Naomi. I'm expelling him. Not anymore, you're not. And you're going to have to provide copies of your class syllabus, reading list, and uh, any other teaching materials to the committee. What for? Well, I imagine you'll want to defend yourself against the bias charge. Bias charge? It's part of the grievance. What is this, I'm on trial now? You can read about it in the grievance. According to Mr. Camp, the two of you have conspired to maliciously discredit him and drive him from the school. Jason Kemp is a pathological liar. You can't believe anything he says. Well, that's a relief. Because he also <laughs> claims that the two of you have an intimate relationship. That's none of your business, Donna. If it influenced your treatment of Mr. Kemp as he claims, this would certainly not look good for someone who wanted to be the next provost of the college. Oh, for God's sake, Donna, the boy's a sociopath. He'll say anything. Not according to Dr. Lerner. You did send him to Lerner, did you not? <laughs> Lerner is an idiot! <laughs> well, why would you send him to someone you thought was an idiot? You know he wrote a story about killing his classmates and me. I know that's what you claim, yes. He calls it aesthetic differences. <laughs> he claims you're censoring his work. We'll look into it. He's lying. He's a master at it. I guess you would know. 
What's that mean? This school doesn't tolerate liars or racists. Yes, so? Mr. Kemp says you recently subjected him to a 10-minute racist rant. He claims you verbally browbeat and humiliated oh, him. That's ridiculous. That I... never happened? Yes, but no, no, he provoked me, yes, but Then but Professor no, Orozco never... Wallace, someone is doing an incredible impersonation of you on the YouTube. <laughs> YouTube, I suggest you check it out. One fine pickle the two of you have gotten yourselves into. Lights fade down <laughs> as Davis and Donna exit. Naomi stands alone and watches as a YouTube video is projected on the back wall. <laughs> it is Naomi from her last meeting with Jason. Oh, you smug little shit. Well, fuck you and fuck Random House. I'm going to tell my story whether they want to hear it or not. And for that matter, fuck history. The angle on the video is odd, as if the camera were somehow on the table in front of her. Her face is imperfectly framed. I'll tell you who told the narrative. You do. Your people. All your great men. Washington, Jefferson. Just a bunch of slave-owning aristocrats who didn't want to pay their taxes. And nothing's changed. Nothing. And the handful of us who are allowed a voice, well, we can be shut up the minute we get out of line. Nothing. Because Naomi stands, everything. watching the video as the lights publishing fade. everything. You don't like what we have to say, you revoke our privilege to say it. End of Act One. <laughs> That's a good play. Are you identifying with in this? This evening um, from MPT to my home. I'm going to cancel it. Yes. Thank you. 
Yes, sir. I got the next to the next, like reminding you can have conversations at the computer. Oh, It'll good. battle the phone for you. Oh, yeah. But it could say, you like the dress I'm wearing? It that says, the, uh, calling 75331. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's not real good. But Brenda, you can talk to it. Your opinion on that at this time. Yeah, uh, that, that's the one you see in the commercial. Exactly. The commercial is hilarious. Yeah. Uh, Malcolm gets you some good Oh, I love it. Just the spelling error. I never oh had no. spell direct no. before. It's like you really got to be careful because yeah. it'll help you. I know. Way turn you down. Okay. Okay. I want to uh, take me home now that I. Well, I'm going now. You take a leap. You're going to look for a cliff to jump off. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> 
I love seeing your business. I'm always so proud. To find a chance and time to do so. So it's nice. These kinds of things really help. saw the first production, I don't know that it was the first performance. Because I was in the great part. I was right around the city. Yes. Yeah. 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 I was there. Very beginning. I'll never forget time we helped Susie move. Put oh, the stuff yeah. up and put the equipment into the warehouse. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there. That's a big party. Oh, it's a big party. Good morning. Of all the sins you can have, it's better. Honor student, act two, scene. On a dark stage, the muted video image of Naomi's rant is projected as it was at the end of act one. Naomi appears in the dim light. Haggard and tired, she wears a bathrobe. She looks like she hasn't slept in days. Jason emerges from the shadows, his backpack is slung over his shoulder. I hope you don't mind, I let myself in. I'm a bit disappointed. I expected something more writerly. Comfy armchairs, books strewn about, stacks of paper, full ashtrays. But this? Eh, freeway motel. <laughs> I fed your cat, she looked hungry. <laughs> Is this a bad time? <laughs> Why not? How did you get in? You let me in. No, I didn't. Two Ambien, five shots of vodka, and that strange purple pill your sister gave you. Well, this is not good. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh. No, it's not. Naomi, you're shaking. Oh, no. Oh, no, oh, no. Why are you doing this? Why am I doing this? It's not what you think. He reaches into his backpack. Davis suddenly enters, Jason disappears. The sound of a window being thrown open as sunlight floods Naomi's dingy apartment. Can we get some light in here? Davis, he was just here. Who was here? Ken? He was, he was. No, it, it, it was nothing. to get out of here. Get back to work. I can't. Yes, you can. No, Davis. You have to get back to work. Teach your classes. Stand up to this. Show everyone you are innocent. But I'm not. Of course you are. I'm sorry. I can't do this. You have to get out there. Tell your side of the story. You can't let this kid, this jerk, win. I keep going over it in my mind, but why, did, how did this happen? When he put his hand in his bag, I thought he would shoot me. It never occurred to me that he was shooting me, capturing me. 
Some version of me. I, I can't believe it. I, I look at this person. Who is this? And what you should do is get a good lawyer and sue that little bastard for invading your privacy. Why are you yelling? I'm not yelling! Yes, you are! He lets her go and searches for her clothes. Why is this happening? It makes no sense. Who knows? He's like some primordial creature, some <laughs> creature that crawled out of my unconscious mind, some twisted distortion of me, my writer self. All the loneliness, the isolation, the selfishness, the paranoia coalesced into this, this kept thing. You might be overthinking this a bit. <laughs> <laughs> when my father was dying, I could have flown out more often to see him. But I didn't want to take time away from my book, my precious book, the book that would make me famous, the book I was writing about my loving, multicultural family. Ha. Huh. You see the irony? We're selfish people, writers. You see what you're getting into? Well, you're getting into some clothes. He hands her some clothes. Why? You have to make a statement to the grievance committee. Kemp's making his. Now we each have to make ours. No. You have to do this. You do it for me. No, no, no. You have to do this. We should go over our stories. Why? Isn't it obvious? But, but that video, that awful video, I'm finished, aren't I? No, not necessarily. You can fight this. I think I've decided I dislike teaching. <laughs> Don't be silly. Your students adore you. You're good at what you do. You know what we should do? Leave. Drop everything and leave. Go out west. Get real jobs. Work outside. Work in the fresh air. Doesn't that sound good? But, babe? Please, be serious. I am. Maybe this is a sign. Time for a change. You may want to commit professional suicide, but I don't. I still have a career, a career I might be able to salvage. If you give up, I'm sunk, so you are not giving up. Naomi begins to dress. I see. Well, you know what I think drew us together? You know, at the start. Oh, fuck. Are we going to talk about our relationship? I get enough of that from my wife. Naomi, please, I'm sorry. No, I... no, I, I'm the one who's sorry. I didn't mean to get all matrimonial on you, all wifely. I was just going to say that I know now what attracted us to each other. We're both selfish. Scene, an office. A table and two chairs. Donna takes notes as she interviews Jason. <coughs> I didn't want to do this. They made me. I see. I felt my freedom of speech was being threatened. Faced with two powerful people, I, I felt I had no options. They made me sign this confession. And the YouTube video? I felt people needed to see what I've been subjected to. And this is how Professor Orozco Wallace talks to you. You didn't provoke her. Anything I say to her seems to set her off. Did Professor Orozco Wallace know you were recording her? I can't say what she knew or didn't know. Was the recording device in plain sight during your conversation? Oh, uh, I can't remember. Did you mention it? I might have. Did you? Is this important? Isn't it illegal to record someone without her consent? Uh, not in this state. As long as one party <laughs> agrees to the taping, me in this case, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Even if the other party doesn't know. Only 12 states have mutual consent laws. Not ours. And we met in a public place, the library. You know the law? I like to know my rights. <laughs> Might I see the entire video you shot? I'm sorry, I, I accidentally erased it. That's a shame. I'm pretty mad at myself about that. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, as for me being a threat, like she said, I went to every single student in that class and asked them point blank, 
do you feel threatened by me? <laughs> and not one single person looked me in the eye and said yes. Not one. It's Professor Roscoe Wallace who's the threat, not me. Scene, an office. A table and two chairs. Donna takes notes as she interviews Naomi. Why do we even have creative writing classes? <laughs> Excuse me? That just seems odd to me that we offer classes in creative writing. Isn't that something students do on their own? <laughs> Most schools offer classes in creative writing. Seems odd. <laughs> students like it. Students like a lot of things, I'm sure. We give them guidance. Oh. Most successful writers have gone through creative writing programs. One wonders how writers like Twain and Dickens managed so long ago. <laughs> I mean most writers today. How lucky we are. Now, <laughs> do you tell your students what to write about? That would defeat the purpose. So you didn't tell Jason Kemp what to write about? No. You only criticize them after they've written their stories? I give them <laughs> feedback, critiques. <laughs> so if the story they write pleases you, you give them a good grade. And if it doesn't, you fail them? No, that's Isn't not. Isn't that just a guessing game on the student's part? You give them no guidelines as to your preferences and prejudices, and they have to hope they please no, you. No, not at all. It's rather subjective. <laughs> no, it's about the construction of the narrative, the power of it, the truth of it, its ability to move us, to delight us, or frighten us. We study form and function, the elements of a good story, character, story. The subject matter doesn't matter. It's how well they handle the art and craft of constructing the story. That's all I'm interested in. The subject matter doesn't matter. Well, no. So, you don't censor their work? <laughs> no, never. According to your criteria, did Jason Kemp write a successful story? A successful According to story? your guidelines, Professor. Well, yes and no. You wouldn't let him read it. And you recommended him later. Yes, because it was frightening. He's frightening. He wrote a story about someone just like himself who comes into a creative writing class just like ours with a gun and begins to torture and murder the students and teacher, i.e. me. Did you even read the fucking story? There is no need for language. <laughs> Do you talk to your students in this manner? Did you read the story? Yes, I did. And? If someone wrote this about a class I was teaching, I would take it as a threat. Yes, thank you. So, why didn't you do anything about it? Excuse me, I did, I went to the dean. Why didn't he do anything about it? Well, wait, didn't he? At the least, Davis could have removed the student from your class, made it some independent credit dodge. Why didn't he? He thought, he thought he could help the boy. Isn't that nice? <laughs> I'm so cynical. Here, I thought Dean Herring didn't want a messy situation while he was up for the provost job. Yes, he wanted to help the boy. <laughs> By the way, there's no such thing as a conditions of continuous agreements on this college. What? The contract Dean Herring and had Mr. Kemp sign, it's meaningless. He made it up. It has no binding authority. It's an administrative placebo. <laughs> you don't have tenure, do you, Ms. Orozco Wallace? Well, I'm not likely to ever to get it, am I? Well, I can't predict these things. Look, can we just cut to the chase? How bad is this? Mm, I would say bad. <laughs> Mr. Kent seems to think that the failure of your novel and your hatred of men, Anglo men in particular, <laughs> contributed to your bias against him. No, I'm biased against him for other reasons. Did the failure of your book make you angry? Well, yeah. Do you or did you blame men or Anglo men for its failure? Oh, you don't know the publishing world. And it's... did this cause you to take out your anger on Mr. Kemp? Absolutely not. Your tirade on the YouTube would suggest otherwise. That was selectively edited. He spent five minutes taunting me before I lost it. Is that on the video? No, anyone would look bad. But you were angry. Well, of course I was angry. 
He's in my life. He, he's suddenly everywhere. He knows things about me. It's creepy. Including your affair with Davis Herring? I'm not. Yes. He says you're working together to expel him. Because he's dangerous. And yet you signed a copy of your book for him when you saw him. Yeah, but he tricked me. He, he manipulated really? me. Really? How? I, 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 I don't know. He, he insinuated things about my father and, and my book. Why did he do that? He's a sociopath. They don't need reasons. I don't think you're qualified to make that diagnosis. He provoked me. You must see that. Isn't that what students do? Try to provoke us, test the limits, see what they can get away with? Yes, And but our job is to be the adult in the room, to outfox them, to reach them and teach them no matter how much they resist. You don't understand. Jason Kemp is different. He's dangerous. He's sick. This is fun to him. I saw it in the day I stopped his reading. He was enjoying it. He smiled. Y you said yourself you believe the story is a threat. Oh, could be. I don't know for certain. And I see him everywhere. What do you mean? On campus. He is a student here. <laughs> <laughs> no. But it's like everywhere I go. It, it's more than a coincidence. And in the last weeks before this happened, I was running into him where I shop, at the, the drugstore, the laundromat, even where I get my takeout. When I think back on it, I was seeing him everywhere. And now, I don't go out. <laughs> Why didn't you tell him? I didn't realize, I didn't think it was important. Can you prove any of this? No. He's going to do something, isn't he? We don't know that. He's going to do something. <laughs> and he's got you interrogating the wrong person. Well, that's where we are. Off the record, what would you do? Donna leans back and fishes a Benson and Hedges 100 from a knit cigarette cozy. She <laughs> <laughs> notices Naomi's look and gives her a cigarette. They light up. <laughs> what would I do, honey, to not get myself in this situation in the first place? I mean it. I learned early on in my career the power of a sharp elbow. You really don't expect women to fight back. They don't. We're supposed to be accommodating, negotiate, compromise. I tell you what, we had a woman provost half these shenanigans would stop overnight. Hmm. Yeah. Wait, do you know what this is like? Jaws. Jaws. <laughs> the movie. Guys go out to hunt this man-eating shark. Halfway through, they realize it's the shark that's been hunting them. Huh. What'd they do? <laughs> I don't see many movies. <laughs> <laughs> they get serious fight for their lives. The shark sinks their boat and eats one of them, but they get him in the end. Tell Jason Kemp I'm going to fight him. Good. Should we be smoking in here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, honey, who's going to stop us? In scene, Davis and Naomi in his <laughs> office. Naomi takes notes. What do we know about him? He's from Mexico, Missouri. Uh, mother works in a bakery. Okay, where'd you say he went to school? Um, some state school. Why'd he leave? Look, I don't know. Didn't you check out his records, his stories, the father, the whole... No, I haven't had time. Look, some things have come up. What? You wanted me to fight this, so I'm fighting. I talked to her. I finally talked to her. I told her. I told her everything, and... And good. No. Good? It's all out in the open. She said no. Excuse me? She said no. What do you mean? She said no! What is this, a 19th century novel? The crazy wife in the attic says no? Things have changed. What do you mean? Pregnant. 
doesn't change how I feel about you. Well, it changes the way I feel about you. I'm sorry. What I'm... were you thinking? Oh, the stairs. Let me sit a minute. Am I interrupting something? No, <laughs> nothing going on here. All right. Well, your friend, Mr. Kemp, has made an offer. What offer? He will drop his grievances against you both if you do not try to expel him. Okay. And if Professor Orozco Wallace apologizes to him. That's it? Oh, and he'd like Professor Orozco Wallace to somehow acknowledge his writing talents. You've got to be kidding. No hearing. It all goes away quietly. Okay. Fine. Good. But he's still a student here? Yes. He's still walking around like nothing happens? Yes. But, and I have to apologize and acknowledge his talents? Correct. No. Naomi, listen to reason. No. No way. I am not apologizing to him. I know what he did. There is no way I'm apologizing to him. Forget it. Could we have a few minutes? Fine. Just make a decision soon. I don't think Mr. Kemp will wait on this. He seems quite anxious to get his apology. I think we should take it. We? What we? There is no we. You are mad at me. I understand. You feel betrayed, but don't throw away- I may away lose my job, my career, whatever, but I am not losing my self-respect. An apology to him is meaningless. I think it means something. We settle now. No one will know. No one will care. I'll know. I'll care. He does this horrible thing and I have to apologize to him. He should be apologizing to me. And so should you. Me? For fucking this up. For not nailing this creep when you had the chance. Conditions of continuance? There's no such thing. You had him sign a contract that's meaningless. I thought I could help him. I thought... What about me? What about helping me? Or was I just someone you were fucking? That's unfair. Oh, the only thing on your mind was your promotion. No, it was not the only thing on my mind. This means something to me, and I'm not apologizing when I'm right. It's a small concession, a compromise, a nothing. It's not nothing. It means something <coughs> to me, and I'm sure it means something to Ginger Kanabi. Ginger. The student who... From the class. In Kemp's story. Why? The one who disappeared. We found her. Good. Is she okay? I don't know. Why? She's home with her parents. She won't talk to me or anyone else. Why not? If she'd talk, I'd know. But she won't. Kemp did something to her. I know it. I just can't prove it. Well, that's it then. Give me a few more days. I'm talking with her parents. We don't have a few days. We have to settle this now. Don't you think it's odd that no one will go on the record about this guy? Everybody's like little fish avoiding the big nasty shark. Maybe that's the smart thing to do. Well, I'm not getting out of his way. Oh, for God's sake. I'm sake. going to stop him. No, no, no. I'm going to stop him whether you help me or not. This is insane. You'll just make him madder than he already is. Well, that's just a risk I'll have to run. Do you want to provoke this guy into actually doing something violent? So now it's my fault if he does something violent? Come on! Stop and think! I can't let him get away with this. I can't! Stop and think about what you are doing, Naomi, please. I have. Oh. And please pass along my congratulations to your wife, Daddy. You must be very happy. Scene, a phone ringing in the dark. Light up on Naomi at a desk making phone calls. Her desk is littered with notepads, a laptop, paper coffee cups, and empty bags of takeout food. A phone is answered in the dark. Hello? Hello. This is Naomi Orozco Wallace. Sorry to disturb America's you, America's not here. Excuse me? America. She has the day off. I don't usually talk on the phone. Hello, is this Mrs. Kemp? A single light rises on Angela Miller. She wears a colorful beach dress with a scarf. There is a faint sound of the ocean. No, my name is... Wait, who is this? 
I'm sorry. I, I'm trying to locate the mother of a student of ours, Jason Kent, and I... I thought you were a Mexican. <laughs> yes, Jason, what about him? You know him? I ought to. He's my son. Oh, uh, our records at the college are incomplete, Mrs. Kemp, and... I haven't been Mrs. Kemp since I divorced his father. Now I'm back to being Angela Miller, my maiden name. And you don't live in Mexico? Mexico? God, no. Mexico, Missouri? Heaven, no. I'm in Cardiff by the sea, California. Just a second. No! Upstairs! Ear Arriba! <laughs> the carpet people are here. I usually let America get the phone. Yes! Upstairs! I'm not sure we're talking about the same person. Jason Kemp, about 22, sandy hair, blue eyes. Very intense, vivid imagination. Yeah, that's him. How is he? He never texts. He's, well, I'm a little concerned about him. Ugh, don't tell me. It's just like his last school. What was it? Webster? Weakness. <laughs> this professor just calls out of the blue. Look, you can't always believe what you hear, especially if it's from a girl. I know. It's like I told the last school, if you admitted him, he's your problem. Not that he's a problem. I think you better talk to his father about this. His father, but isn't he dead? Dead? He better not be. He owes me 200000 <laughs> <laughs> He's a hedge fund manager. I've got an estate in Ladue, a loft in Tribeca. I'll get you his number. Ear Ariba! Ariba! <laughs> I gotta go. She disappears as Mr. Kemp another light, apparently in his limo. He wears heavy black framed glasses and is talking on his iPhone. Dead? Yeah, I'm certainly not dead, Miss uh, um, uh, Professor. Uh, Roscoe Wallace. Well, sir, he led us to believe that you died in a shooting. Are you sure? First I've heard of it. <laughs> Damn strange. Why would he say something like that? I was hoping you'd be able to shed some light on the matter. He's a cipher, that boy. <laughs> Brilliant, but a cipher. Very good with computers. Uh, too good, if you know what I mean. Damn fine tennis player, too. We played varsity at Country Day. Has he turned out for your team? I don't know that we have one. Oh. You didn't call me to talk about tennis, did you, Mrs. Roscoe Wallace? No, I did not. Well, whatever he's done, I'm sure it was just a prank. This is a bit more than a prank, Mr. Kemp. Making mountains out of molehills. That's uh, just like that last school that he went to. And what school was that? It, he seems to have left it off his application. What school? Look, I have a plane to catch. You'll have to contact my lawyer. I have nothing more to say on the matter. Wait, Mr. Kemp. She lights down on him as lights rise on Professor K. Prosser. She is very well put together, very professional, very proper. Well, I'm not sure I should say it. Please, it's important. There were some accusations. About? Certain inappropriate behavior. Yes. I don't think I should. Oh. Jason's a very talented young man. Dr. Prosser. Very. Created. Dr. Prosser, is Jason Kemp dangerous? Perhaps you should talk to an administrator. God, no, I want the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Please, it's important. Certain things have happened, and I... I, I can't get involved in this. Oh, anything you say will be kept in the strictest confidence. Please. Jason Kemp is not someone you want to become entangled with. Believe me, I know. He comes into your life like a bad infection. Is he violent? I can't. I can't. You just don't know. There was this girl he was with, or uh, thought he was with. She may have had other ideas. There were rumors. Things you hope aren't true. He was very sweet. Very quiet. She was in my class, too. You've never had guests 
something was going on between them. She had an odd name, too. She disappeared right before he did. What was her name? Oh, Ginger. Ginger Kanabi, with a K. You will keep my name out of this. And she is gone. See Naomi's office. Naomi is going over some notes on a legal pad at her desk. Jason bursts in, his backpack is slung over his shoulder. You had no right, no right whatsoever. Jason, what are you doing You here? had no right to call my you mother, none. You need to leave my office right now. I'll make you pay I'm for that. Security. No, you're not. I didn't give you permission to I call don't my mother. I your permission. Yes, you to do. Call, the call her back. Tell her if you made I'm a mistake. I'm concerned about a student's behavior. There's nothing to be concerned about. If I'm concerned about a student's oh, behavior. Oh, bullshit. You're only concerned because I'm standing up to you. Jason, he drops listen. his backpack on her desk with a heavy thud. What did she tell you? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing, as it turns out. You're lying. Seems to know next to nothing about you. Very funny. I'm sorry if this upsets you. Upsets me? I'm not upset. My mistake. Calling my mother on me? You're so middle class, Naomi. <laughs> thinking I care about stuff like that. If you don't care, why are you here? You know why. You know why. He reaches into his backpack. Davis enters, Jason stops and shoulders his backpack. You're meeting him? It appears I am. Are you settling this? In a way. This will be over soon. Good. Do you want me to stay? No. Davis, go. I think you should stay. We don't need him. I to want him to stay, Naomi. I don't know that I like your tone. My tone? <coughs> Davis notices the backpack on Jason's shoulder. What's going on? All right. Take a breath. We were just having a discussion about parents. <clears throat> Weren't we, Jason? Jason feels very protective about his mother. You leave her out of this. Being a widow and all. But I know what it's like to lose a father. Remember? That's what you said to me the last time we met. I know what it's like to lose a father. Naomi, this is not a good idea. Out of the blue, he says that, like a slap across the face. How did he know? We need to stop this pain, right now. The everlasting pain. To know you'll never. But I have good news <coughs> for you, Jason. I talked to your father. It's a miracle. He's alive, reincarnated as a hedge fund manager. He says you're a whiz with computers. <clears throat> One hell of a tennis player, by the way, wants to know if you play for our team. No, 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 you did not, He's did not, not do dead. that. Your father's not he, dead. He is to me. You had no right to right do to that. Right to to invade your privacy like you invaded my privacy? That's a lie. You're paranoid. Stop this now, Jason. If you don't leave, it's I'm calling security. Up, isn't it? Your working class family, your tragic history, your father's murder, your whole life is a fiction. You, Mr. Kemp, are a fraud. Jason lurches towards her, swinging his backpack off of his shoulder. Davis fumbles a phone out of his coat pocket, but does not dial. I'm the fraud? What about you? You censored my work. The Latina, who can't be heard, denied my free speech. You forced me to sign some bullshit fake document. You subjected me to a 10 minute racist rant that everybody's seen. And now you spied on my family? At that hearing tomorrow, you and your boyfriend are going down. Nobody cares what a frustrated, has-been writer like you has to say. Nobody! True. But they might care to hear what Ginger Kanabi has to say. Ginger? What about her? Wait a second. What are you saying? I had it all wrong. She didn't talk to you. I thought this was about me. 
it's about Bullshit! Ginger. It was always about Ginger, wasn't it? Your fixation. She wouldn't have talked to you. No, no way. No way. You you have no right. No right to drag her into this. I have no right. What Ginger and I have is special. So special she's now left two schools to get away from you? That's not true. She asked me to come here, and it was her idea. We, 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 we love each other. Then why isn't she here? Why? You scared her off. Me? How? You stopped my reading. You were reading a story about a mass murder in a creative writing class featuring your classmates. No, no, that's not what we planned. We? Ginger and me. Ask yourself, would she have stayed in the class for two months if she thought I was was stalking her? Fear does strange things to people. You don't get it. No, I don't. Enlighten me. The story she read that day. Ginger read before me. The story about the turtle's death. The sad story nobody had a reaction to. Yeah. It's the same story I mentioned at the beginning of my story. The same story. My character comes in and listens to the same story that Ginger has just read in class. How would I have known to put that in my story if Ginger and I weren't working together? Is that true? It was a prank. I told you. But you wouldn't let me finish. You wouldn't listen. And then all this happened. Ginger freaked out, started getting stomach aches. She thought you'd throw us both out of school. You don't know her parents, and that's why she left. Jason. She left because of you. Jason. I tried to protect her, but you just wouldn't stop. Why? Because you're dangerous. You're the dangerous one. I don't think Ginger would say that. I can tell you what Ginger will say. Oh, can you? We agreed. We had an agreement that if her parents found out, if they found out, she'd blame me. Say I did it alone. Alone. She knew nothing. I'd take the blame to protect her. That's your best story yet. What is wrong with you? This was never about free speech or me or anything else. For two months, Ginger Kanavi lived in terror of you, too scared to do anything or say anything to anyone. Maybe she was nice to you once, and you've been torturing her ever since. I should have seen it, but I didn't. No, 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 you'll see. Then, when nothing happened, she somehow convinced herself that everything was okay. That is the power of denial, the benefit of the doubt, the little gray area people like you operate in. People like me? So one day when she was crossing the quad or leaving the library or the cafeteria, she found herself walking along with you. And you fell into a brief, pleasant conversation. It ended with you asking her what story she was reading for our next class. And she told you. The poor, sweet girl told you, thinking, hoping probably, that you'd change. You're making it all up. You don't know anything. Here's what I know. I know that she had to sit in class and listen to your description of her. Listen to the description of her, of her tears dropping in my crotch as I came in her mouth. That's what I know. And that's where I stopped you. So here's your apology and my acknowledgement of your unique talent. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I didn't stop you sooner. And you do have a unique talent, a talent for hurting people. You're pathetic. You have no idea. You have no idea. You have no idea what you've done, you fraud. A failed writer passing herself off as some great authority. What a joke. OK. I think we're done here. Oh, no, we're not. Oh, I think we are. See, I gave you a chance. You failed. You never got me. I live my work. It is me. I am it. This is new, cutting edge, pushing the envelope stuff. It's visceral, dangerous. I'm a performance writer. I'm glad you don't get it, because you're mired in the past. Identity politics. What can we learn about this issue, class? Who can we blame for this? Who can we blame for that? What about the whale's feelings in Moby Dick? All that old PC bullshit. You're so busy looking for the meaning that you lose the being. Your time is up. You are so dead. Jason suddenly shoves a hand into his backpack. The backpack! Stop, Jason! Uh, just, what in God's stop. name is going on in here? Stop this! Just the backpack! He's gonna dump it in! What has he got? Jason! Jason takes a green apple from his backpack, crosses to Naomi's desk, and places the apple on her desk. I'll be seeing you. Oh my god. I thought for sure. He was going to. Yes. What? But he didn't. What in the world just happened here? Wow. That was, 
That was a rush. <laughs> a rush? Fighting with a student? Are you both insane? <laughs> I guess we are. Oh my god. He barged in <clears throat> unannounced, stopped me when I tried to call security. Then Davis came in and then he went for his back to get an apple? Great, just great. We were so close to ending this seedy business. <sighs> Naomi, I have Ginger Kanabi and her parents in my office. They want to see you. Is she okay? Oh, yes, yes, she's fine. It's you they want to see. They're filling out some paperwork now. Just finish up here and come down as soon as you can. What a day! She lights a cigarette. Ah, oh, that's better. Did you hear? I've been appointed interim provost. <laughs> Assigned yeah. to the dark side, I suppose. What? <laughs> when was this? This morning. Why wasn't I told? I'm still reeling. No need for congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> then my first order of business will be a little house cleaning. Wrap up this Kemp affair. Naomi, I can get him off campus, but beyond that... Uh, I know, I know, as long as Ginger's up. Oh, she's going to be just fine. So, in about five minutes? Yeah, I just need to grab a few things. Oh, I'll yes. be right down. Good. I think you'll be relieved when you hear her story. Well, relieved is not quite the right word. What's between horror and relief? <laughs> Catharsis? No, that's not it. <laughs> Naomi puts a briefcase on her desk. She pulls open a desk drawer and begins to throw personal items into the briefcase. Sorry about your promotion. Yeah. Well, you want me to go with you? No. I'm not going to bother packing my office. I'm just taking a few personal items. What do you mean? You're not leaving. I'm quitting. Because of this? Us? Yes. This and us. Some things are just too painful. I, now I hurt. I just hurt. I think I loved you. There. I said it in the past tense. Well, I love you, Naomi. But I know I screwed some things up, but I can fix things. I can. And I'm sorry if No, no, no. No fixing things. No more sorries. I need to go away. And you should go home too. Go, go. Go back to your <coughs> wife. She needs you. You never really left her, did you? Look, in a few days we'll talk, okay? Consider this my resignation. You can't resign. I believe I just did. I won't accept it. It's not up to you. Let me give you my office key. You'll reconsider. I'm going to see Ginger, and then I'm done. Goodbye, Davis. She closes her briefcase and tosses him the key. Lights down on Naomi's office and up on Naomi alone in the light. Sometimes you have to lose something in order to find something. Time slows down when you're unemployed. Space opens up. Instead of mourning a dead father, a dead book, and a lost love, I reconnected with my cat. <laughs> I rediscovered sleep, deep sleep. And then a funny thing happened. I started writing, and writing, and writing. I found my story. And the next thing I knew, I had a book. It's about an unhappy teacher and a troubled young man. <laughs> the young man writes a story in her creative writing class about a young man who comes into a creative writing class and begins to torment and shoot his teacher and classmates. It's a terrible ordeal. It's called Honor Student. The book is out now. It's selling very well. The teacher survives. She gets better. She finds her voice, and she starts writing again. Can I sign a copy for you? End of play.
refers to you. Top of your head, what's, what's an image what thing? What happened to Ginger? What happened to Ginger? <laughs> <laughs> well, do you have a theory? Was anything suggested to you? Anybody else have an idea what happened to Ginger? She moved to another school. Yeah? What are the other things that are, uh, uh, are at the top of your head right now? This is, you think that- I, I want to see the sequel to this story. <laughs> do you? Yeah. Who's the star of the sequel? Well, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, but there's a lot of unfinished, there's a lot of unfinished business. A lot of unfinished business, he says. Anybody else? What, um, yeah. Just how complicated a situation is because there's human beings involved. I mean, that's a really dumb statement, but I mean, no. um, from the outside, if you just read a short news item about it, this conflict in the university, um, you could come to completely different conclusions about what was going on <coughs> than we have that shift all the way through the play, which makes it so interesting. Every time a new scene is played, you think, oh, oh, maybe he is innocent. Oh, no, no, he's not innocent at all. <laughs> so you went back and forth yeah. and, 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 and along, the, along the progress of the story? Cool. Yeah, you have to wonder what his real motivation was, Jason. And what do you, did you did you doubt him from the beginning or did you think he did you well you didn't know you just didn't know and you still don't know at the end I mean that's yeah. the thing you don't know what really is going on yeah yes sir the characterizations were so good that I think I've met all four of them <laughs> <laughs> have you <laughs> anybody else feel that way people you know or maybe see yourself <laughs> what. Well, Anybody want to answer this question? What characters uh, do you relate to the most? Which one uh, seemed to feel most like? It's <laughs> 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 me. Oh. When you tell your friends about this play tomorrow, what, what character are you going to talk about, do you think? Yes, sir. Well, it's interesting to me that, that while in the second, while well, the first act um, is back and forth between teacher and the student as to who was perceiving reality better. In the second act, it, it seemed to go heavily in the teacher's favor, but then at the end, the student came back strong. So it was, uh, <laughs> it was uh, I would, I would, I, I would, I'm, uh, I think that I, that I, it's the student that, what he says about uh, performance, Get the words, but uh, the being of, of, of the, a different kind of fiction. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he's, he plays his ace right there. Yeah. And the stopping of calling security, which seemed to con condemn him, is lost. I mean, that's because he's played his ace. And I don't know, I'm still left wondering, because I don't know what happened to Ginger. Mm -hmm. and that was, and that still leaves me wondering. Ginger's on. Is Ginger's on your mind, yours as well? Mm -hmm. Well, but I mean, it's pretty clear that if it's between horror and, and relief. Uh, relief, that something horrible happened to her. Isn't, isn't that true? I mean, I, I don't know. It, well, well I, I mean, I would be very interested to know if that's what you, how you take it. I just read yeah. into that yeah. that the relief would be um, the teachers, the professors, because uh, something did happen to Ginger, indeed. Gotcha. Uh, so mm -hmm. she'd be relieved to find out she was vindicated. Yeah. And that. But the horror is that something happened to Ginger. Oh. So I thought the relief was that Ginger was fine, but the horror is that you're out of a job. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you hear that? Yes. <laughs> this is the second time I've seen the play, and something happened to me last November when I was kissing my friend, and I sort of flew off the handle. And after seeing this play, I reconsidered what happened that night, and I decided it was my fault. I should have kept my mouth shut because once I flew off the handle, it let the other person get a handle on me that they would not have had if I had just kept quiet. Uh -huh. So I it's had a personal that. influence on me. Interesting. Yes, sir. Um, I, have, I have an ominous read about the end. I would feel think? like between horror and relief, for me, the interpretation is that Jason had more truth than she thinks. That Ginger and Jason do have something there more than she understood. Mm -hmm. So the horror of 
oh my god, he was telling the truth, and the relief of, oh my god, I'm, I'm getting out of here. Um, so, and I, and I, I, in terms of characters that we're drawn to, but aside from Donna, I always wanted Jason on stage. Really? So, um, it's like subversiveness, it's subversive joy, because I wanted him to fuck things up. <laughs> <laughs> Mess around some more with stuff. Yeah. The idea that this whole thing might have been some kind of a performance art frightens me. Um, and yet, if indeed it is, we're going to have to totally rethink this whole thing. I mean, if indeed you, you were writing this performance piece where she wrote hers and you wrote yours about her writing hers, then um, we're going to have to rethink this. And, and so then, are we the ones that are thinking these horrible things? Are we also putting the submachine gun in the backpack? Is it us? Or is it real? So you're not sure what that uh, achieved, or was that? Oh, because proof that was proof of his capability to be, you know, malicious. I mean, so what role did that second yeah, story have yeah. to do in sort of tell that story about oh, Jason? Well, yeah. It proves he can write fiction. How did you feel? Oh, go ahead. I thought he was like an infection. I thought that yeah. that was exactly what was said over there on the phone. He's like an infection. And I never saw it any other way. Yeah. I see now that the whole thing could have been his idea of performance art in getting everybody upset, in going, you know, and making the complaint and getting people to lose their jobs. It's all part of just let's see how far we can make it go by being dangerous. But I never thought he was anything but malicious and manipulative. I see. So you're in favor of censorship. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Jason tag. <laughs> You're saying I'm a bad writer? <laughs> oh, yes. If indeed the, the little portion of his home life is as we saw it, then he has very little power in this world. And so all that you're doing is about your power and what you can cause to happen. And that to me is kind of scary in the student-teacher idea mm -hmm. that, that a student could actually, instead of trying to learn, could actually try to manipulate the professor. Yeah. And that's scary. <laughs> yes, Rebecca. I, I found the, uh, the conversations with the parents, the telephone conversations with the parents, to really be kind of really revealing because that really did establish that he's not entirely truthful. And when you have, I mean, up to <coughs> that point, it's kind of like, what's really going on here? But once those conversations occurred, then you come, it, at least I came to the conclusion that this guy really is playing fast and loose with facts. So it put it in a little bit different light because up to that point, I was really beginning to kind of think that the, the professor was a little unhinged. <laughs> but with, with, uh, with, with that revelation, you start saying, maybe she isn't as unhinged as you sort of thought she was. And did you feel that uh, kind of until that point, that she was unhinged? Uh, yeah, until I, that, I did. Until you I, realized I that he like lied about his she parents? she was really kind of getting things out of the realm of reality. But once those conversations occurred, it's sort of saying, oh, maybe she's not as far off would anybody else like to talk about your response to Naomi's response initially? I mean, how, how did that land on you? Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I totally agree. I think one of the coolest things about the play is it takes a premise that um, I think you would immediately say, oh yes, the threatening student is in the wrong. And very early on, because of the way the characters are, it keeps you in a very cool way off balance. She's a bad teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Back and forth, and it's not always the action per se, because it's like this pipe of characters that they are. He's very 
Thanks, John. It's very you know, exciting to have on stage. Mm. And it's not until we find out that he's a line of shit that he goes, <laughs> oh, <laughs> the whole time. But it, it was terrific. I, I thought it was terrific. Uh, yes. yes, 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 sir. I feel like that the last speech that uh, she made uh, indicated to me that she had experienced something that really helped her to find herself. Although she was telling the same story in her book, yeah. but she was now successful. And it seems like she was really beginning to realize that I've got to work through some things to be me and to produce. And I thought that's what the student was to almost trying to tell her, too. Oh, so yeah. you gave her something? <laughs> was it was a gift. It was a gift. show that Michael J. Fox played the son of the family ties. Family ties. Family ties. And he, he's, he's not what they expected given his political beliefs and style of dress. And yet he, and because of who he is, he's clever and smart and he can outwit them. And that's kind of, it seems to me, what's happening here. It, and it, the, uh, it, it, it's the creation of a great evil character. And, and yeah. It, and, and, and it, it, I think it, to the extent that we, that we, he remains viable to the end, I think the play retains its excitement. And it's, and, and it's a, mm, I, I don't, I don't think you can, I don't think you can utterly defeat him and have, and have the audience stay interested. Oh, really? Interesting. Okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I agree with yeah. those sentiments, but what is always the most dynamic thing for this in this play for me is um, Jason manipulating these people who have, the, Naomi and, and Dean Davis specifically have really big baggage and really, <laughs> really complex situations. Right. And I think he sees that and exploits that. And what's really interesting is to have a character who is younger and in less status, you know, gain power over them by exploiting their lives. Mm -hmm. um, and th th that's something really interesting, mm -hmm. especially with a teacher and student presentation. Right, right. Well, I'd like to introduce you to the creator of this evil character. Mm -hmm. You can see what you think. Um, Michael Erickson, playwright, come join us up here. <laughs> about a year, exactly a year ago, um, uh, and uh, uh, just some, some things. Uh, I started with Naomi, her, I, 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 she just sort of appeared to me, and uh, I had this image of a, a, a very talented but a very frustrated, almost self-destructive young woman uh, who stuck in her life, wasn't going anywhere, and, uh, 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 and this horrible, Thing comes in, into her, her life. I knew some, you know, something was going to come in and really disrupt her life that would that most people would look at and say, well, that, that, that's a terrible thing. But out of that, she would uh, uh, pull herself together, get out of a bad relationship that has no future, get out of a job that she really didn't like or wasn't suited for, and, and get back to the thing that she can really do. And that, and that, and that was the uh, genesis of it. So I started with Naomi. <coughs> And it grew from, from there. Do you have any questions, Michael? Yes, sir. I got a question. And, uh, to what extent did you study the First Amendment case law? Because <laughs> 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 you mentioned a bit of it in the script. Uh, I, About yelling fire in a crowded place. Yeah. Uh, well, that was an actual case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I didn't like go to a law library and dig oh, through okay. books or things. Like, but uh, I just it sort of. You're not an attorney. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not. In fact, <laughs> I, I, was, I was kind of worried about it in some some places. But uh, a, a playwright attorney that I know, uh, who's who's uh, uh, read it, uh, um, um, said uh, said it's 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 correct. It's it's, it's right. So I was very happy. Tell us your thoughts about the young student, 
Yeah. And how he evolved. Um, He's not you, is he? <laughs> I, I, I think he's a, a lot of students that I've, I've known or, or heard about over the years. Uh, uh, um, uh, he, uh, he grew and changed throughout this writing process. I mean, the play has really evolved uh, since we started in, in September. It's really, uh, uh, believe it or not, there are sheep in, in, in an earlier <laughs> <laughs> and, and people, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Deets really and Lauren were, were telling actually. me, you really don't need that. And I, no, I got it. Anyway, uh, uh, so uh, it, it, it's you know, you know it's a process, and you and you win and you win. And Jason really changed. He you know you know he he was more explicitly um, uh, a bad. And 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 as I worked on him, you know, I began to to realize, oh oh yeah, what if what if you know? And you start adding those those little nuances and things like that, and. Um, as, 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 as you said, you know, you have these encounters in life, and you have these blow-ups, and you think you're right at the moment, but then in, in calm, cool reflection, you think, oh, wait a second, but, you know, and so uh, that, you know, I, I started getting more and more of that in as I, 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 I rewrote it and fixed it. Well, was he psychopathic or playing a game? <laughs> Is there a difference? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if he's playing a game like this, then then would a, a, a rational person play a game like this? I, I mean, I mean, I, I keep going back and forth on it. I mean, I mean, some days I wake up and I go, oh yeah, yeah, he's he's a sociopath. And then other days I get up and I think, no, he's a cutting edge artist. He's doing something really interesting. And 50 years from now, we'll be studying his his body of work. <laughs> So I, 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 I honestly keep going back and forth, back and forth. But the constant has always been Naomi, that yeah. that she is stuck in her life, creatively stuck. And for a writer, it's it's a yeah. terrible, terrible. And she sacrificed so much to me, her family, I, that ironically she's writing about. And this this is like just a slap in the face, and it, and it wakes her up, and she she goes on. Is the dean a real dean somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> According to lawyer Joe Musso, uh, he said, and he's litigated a lot of these Kate cases and, 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 and been in depositions with a lot of them. He said 90% of the time when these things blow up, it's the dean. But can I just say that these actors are phenomenal. And I think that, uh, we, had, uh, we had three rehearsals, and I was throwing rewrites at them even up to the last rehearsal. I think I dragged in 30, 40 pages of this stuff. And they, they just it. took it on. They just took it on. They, they, they just. They, they just went for it. Like the and she are, could do are, throwaway lines yeah. better than anybody I've yeah. ever seen. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> like tossing them over her shoulder, but they were so effective. Yeah. The administrators are great. Yeah. Your, the, your portraits of the administrators, your two administrators are really, really deaf. Thanks. <laughs> I thought it was great how you actually got every character to have a voice and you stuck with it. There's no bleed over. Um, it's, I think it's hard when one person writes four personalities, or 16, or however many there are, um, yeah. without having them bleed over. And you didn't, ever. I mean, they're all very concise in their own little world. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. There's Thank a, a real uh, conflict of interest. It's a very small thing in the play, but the head of grievance committee is going for the same position as the dean to can keep his faith in grievance committee. And, and yeah, I, yeah. I, I should make it clear that. <laughs> and that she smoked. Trevor always mentions that. a physical health hazard. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever mentions that. <laughs> Flippant. <laughs> Who's going to say it? <laughs> I didn't know if that was intentional, but it's it yeah. It happened. A, a, number of years, a number of 
years ago, David Mamet wrote a play called Oleana. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Th are, are you familiar with it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, because the first act, w I was like, okay, this is, looks like Oleana, because you never know who's you know, yeah. right or wrong, or if there is a right or wrong. I mean, did that influence you at all, or was that something you thought about, or was he just a hack? <laughs> I, uh, I, 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 when, when I did the first draft and I came here in September, I thought I had another six degrees of separation. I thought I was John Guar. I thought I had this collage of voices and dreams and images, and the play thought otherwise. It wants to be something else. It wanted to be something else, and what I had to face up to and acknowledge, and, and Lauren and Dietz and my fellow playwrights who are all here, kept pushing me uh, to do was to go with what the play wants. So, so not not consciously, no. <laughs> well, thank you. Oh, you get one more? I just wanted to say that w one of the things I loved was the, the conversation about subtext at the beginning, mm -hmm. back and forth, and then that being such a theme, such a such a life in it, it up to the, the rocks in the pockets, you know, the threat of suicide throughout, sort of the threat of death. It just felt like, oh, this is a very teachable play, besides the great characters and the, the subject matter, giving us so much to talk about. And the language, the language level. It was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, Yeah. <laughs> you know, so she deals with that. It's a lot of stress. She's always kind of stressed. 